Good morning, viewers. It is 7.16 a.m. And welcome back to the Tobago Updates Morning Show, coming to you here live from the Port Mall in Scarborough this morning. Viewers, I am Julian Skeet, and in this segment, we are chatting with Jason Arter. We want to welcome Jason on set this morning. Morning, morning to you, sir. Thank you, sir. All, All right. right. And today, in fact, you're here in a different capacity. Normally, it might be the Bishops Alumni Association, but you're here in a different capacity this morning as we're speaking to the politics and the happenings of the day specifically. So we want to get started, and I want to get, in the first instance, your initial reactions uh, earlier this week um, when the resignation came out of the respective the 13 assemblymen taking that position. Um. Well, I was happy like Papi, right? Um, I thought it was the best thing for them to do. Um, you know, for me, it's kind of personal uh, in the sense that um, I, I watched everything sort of unfold. And I remember um, watching that, 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 that day when Mr. Duke said, the party is mine. And for me, I had a visceral reaction to that because I've been involved in no less than three projects where people, quote unquote, started something, couldn't go further with the thing, brought me into the thing, yeah? And when the thing started to go very well, turned around and claimed it for themselves. And so you're using people's efforts, and then when things get going, you say it's all yours because you started it. Anybody can start anything. But did you take it to where it became viable? And I know because I live in Tobago, when this thing started, you would hear all these stories coming back. I mean, I'm friends with, you know, this one and that one. I wouldn't necessarily call their names or whatever. And you're hearing the stories coming back and you're hearing the, the anecdotes about, uh, for instance, like uh, when they were supposed to, each of them come out, you know, so you had, let me say it this way, so you had Melanie Roberts, she came out, and then you had this one, and you had that one. And there was a sort of a ruling out process. And when they were doing that, as far as I know, Farley was supposed to come out much later than he did. But part of the reason that he came out earlier was because they realized they were not getting traction. So what it means is that you, you well, we can say now used, you use this person to get what it is you wanted, and now you say it's all yours. And so for me, I had a visceral reaction to that. First time it happened to me was when I was living in the US, you know? And um, when I saw that, I said, yeah, that's what you should do, because that is what I had to do. Far, far, far separate from the other issues and so forth. For me, it was very personal. Get out. If we built it together and it's all yours, get out. And I suppose that goes with the title, and he's usually very clear on that with the, with, with the political leader, owner, and founder uh, of the Progressive Democratic Patriots. And, and at this point, we want to fast forward to the happenings. Um, the resignation has led to a situation now where it is, once again, um, the Tobago House of Assembly Act uh, is receiving separate types of interpretation and by extension the standing orders being utilized. The Progressive Democratic Patriots political leader Watson Duke has put forward and sent a letter to the presiding officer making a request um, indicating that based on the relevant sections of the standing order and the references being tied to, uh, you know, making that connection in the context of the parliament uh, in Trinidad. Tell us a little bit from your understanding, the, the, the distinctions rather between what we look at very broadly as the THA Act, our constitution, and more importantly, interpretations regarding the, the, the standing orders. Right. So... <clears throat> I think part of, the, part of the issue here is that there isn't a clear distinction between one set of documents versus the other set of documents. So the first set of documents we're talking about are the Constitution of Trinidad and Tobago and the THA Act. Now, the THA Act itself is a part of the Constitution. Yeah? Correct. So those are the two documents we're talking about on one side. On the other side, we're talking about the standing orders of the Tobago House of Assembly and the standing orders of the, of, the, of the House of Representatives in Trinidad. Yeah? Okay. The THA Act, I'm just going to use the Act for now. The THA Act defines what things are. For instance, 
what's a minority leader, what's a chief secretary, blah, 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 to include how does an assemblyman demit office, right? That's the act. The standing orders are or is the document that says, how do we function within the assembly? When we meet, uh, who talks first, who talks second? If a question is asked, how is the question supposed to be phrased? Blah, 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 right? Those are the standing orders. So that's the act, the standing orders. Similarly, in Trinidad, you have the constitution that defines who can be a representative, blah, 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 same kind of thing. And then you have standing orders. They have their own standing orders as well. Okay? Now, what's going on is that there is a section within the House of Assembly's standing orders, section 92, that says, if we meet up something in our day-to-day -day operations that we have never seen, we will look to refer to the practice of the standing orders of the House of Representatives, not the Constitution. It is in the Constitution where they define how somebody gets removed from the House of Representatives. But we are not looking, our standing orders are not looking to the Constitution. Our standing orders are saying, if we meet up something that we haven't seen, we will refer to the standing orders of the House of Representatives. And let me make another point. The standing orders of the House of Representatives, you know what it says about itself? If it sees something, or if it meets something in the day-to-day -day operations of the House of Representatives that it hasn't seen, you know what it has said that it will do? It will look to the standing orders of the House of Commons in the UK. Now, you can't tell me that what they're actually saying is that they're going to look to the laws of the UK. We have our own laws. You understand? So anybody who is trying to pretend that they don't understand what this stuff means, they're engaging in not, what, not, not misinformation, disinformation. I am trying to mislead you. That is, that is all. So, what, so in, your, in your estimation, you're saying that the comparative is uh, seeking... Um, a guidance, so to speak, and just to refer to this uh, very clearly, this is uh, section 92 yes. of the Tobago House of Assembly standing orders, which indicate that in any matter not herein provided for, report shall be had to the usage and practice of the House of Representatives, which shall be followed as far as uh, the same may be applicable to the Assembly and not inconsistent with these standing orders, nor with the practice of this Assembly. So you are, you are saying comparatively for you, um, based on your interpretation is that the, the guidance is to be sought through the said standing orders uh, of the, the House of Representatives of the Parliament of Trinidad and Tobago. And I, I am saying this is not my interpretation. If you read number two, Mm -hmm. right? Read number two. And number two goes on to say, in the case of doubt, the standing orders of the assembly shall be interpreted in light of the relevance, usage, and practice of the House of Representatives. And then it goes on to say, no restrictions as item three, no restrictions which the House of Representatives has introduced by standing orders shall be deemed to so, the extent... Mm -hmm. So let me interrupt you. It says, no restrictions as introduced by the standing orders of the House of Representatives. Mm -hmm. Not the TNT Constitution, the standing orders of the House of Representatives. You just read it. So I'm not interpreting it. It literally says it. If you refuse to read that part and you cherry pick, then you could end up in a scenario where people are interpreting. It literally says it right there. I'm not interpreting it. This is not my opinion. It's right there. So in a circumstance, would you say that we are once again falling into a scenario where, um, as I put it in an earlier show this week, that this was the same area that uh, there was an attempt to use in 2021. Um, and of course, the matter didn't get as far as it had intended in terms of a similar reference to 
uh, seeking guidance through. And, and people made all sorts of ups and downs in relation to it seems archaic and it seems outdated, when in truth and in fact, there was an indication um, d defined in the context of drawing lots and so on mm -hmm. um, in relation to making a determination. Do you see once again that this is a section that will not be able to stand up with what is currently being proposed or put forward um, as the direction and seeking the intervention of the courts to make a determination? You think that it's very, it's very likely to face the same kind of challenge and not stand up to be able to yield the results that the political leader of the PDP is hoping to achieve coming out of this? Right, so I, I'm, I'm gonna speak in more certain language than a lot of people. I absolutely know that that will go nowhere. It can't go anywhere, yeah? Here's the funny thing. The section of the Constitution that they're referring to, where in the House of Representatives, if you leave your party, you have to demit office. That was put into the Constitution in 1978, okay? Which means it wasn't there before yeah and so what it means is this if you want to do something like that you have to make it law yes well as it stands right now in tobago on the tha act we have four conditions under which an assemblyman is removed if you want to put in a fifth condition then you have to make it so you understand what i'm saying you have to make it so now, one of the curiosities is this. You might want to ask yourself a question like, uh, hmm, so when we first developed our constitution, which is pretty much predicated on the Westminster system, yeah, and our function of our parliament, I should say, um, how come that law wasn't in there? Why did they have to put it in in 1978? Is it that when they copied it over from the UK, they didn't have a law like that? And you know what the answer is? You know there's no law like that in the UK. There's no law prohibit you, prohibiting you from, from crossing the floor. We decided to do that. And why did we decide to do that? Because our politicians want more power than they already have. And one of the things that, 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 I, that I aim to do, hopefully, is to do a nice little video showing why I think the Westminster system is the worst thing for Caribbean islands. The fact of the matter is, and I can't go, go into it here, the fact of the matter is that the Westminster system confers far more power on our politicians than they do in these very large countries where they were applied. But like I said, I can't get into it here. But the thing is, so, so what that means to me is you already have far more power than the, the, the system, right, that you've copied, give to other people in other jurisdictions. And then you want even more power and more control. And the question that people have to ask themselves is this. To what extent do you want the politicians to have so much power? Is it in your benefit for the politicians to have so much power? I know for me what the answer is. I can't answer for anybody else. The answer is no. I don't want them to have all that power. You have enough power. If somebody wants to leave your party because maybe they disagree with something you're doing in principle and we voted them in, then they should be able to leave. Maybe they're leaving because you're doing something that's against us, but you're threatening them now that if they leave, you're going to take it away from them. Let me, let me look at, you know, just to look at a different perspective. Do you feel, and people make the very strong indications of political parties, but do you still feel that in 2022, and most recently the elections of 2021, that as a people in Trinidad and Tobago, and more specifically in Tobago, the vast majority of us voted because of party or because of the persons that were presented? Because I, and I'm premising that question on when the issue arose specific in discussions to whether or not we should have um, a leader's face off, Farley versus Tracy, um, you know, in terms of pushing and prompting the direction, this is who our leadership is going to be, almost similar to the U.S. model, uh, where it is fashioned by the leader and by extension those others. Where do you feel we're at uh, as, as a people in that context? So... <clears throat> You know, I've seen a lot of conversation about when people voted, they voted for the PDP uh, versus the PNM. 
And so it's one brand versus the other, and it's not the person and so forth. So let's start with Tobago. In Tobago, at election time, what do the political parties do? They go around the island looking for people they deem to be electable. What does that mean? Those persons already are deemed to have currency. Meaning if you put them up, they can get elected. So when you turn around and you say that the people voted for the party, is that totally true? And I'm, I'm using the word totally true because some of it may be in there. Correct. Right? But is it totally true? You look for people who are already electable. So to me, it's unethical for you to start saying that you want to claim that person's victory as all your own when you went looking for electable people in the first place. It's not like in the U.S., where oftentimes the place is so big, you don't even actually know who you're voting for. What happens is they put this person on TV and they turn them into this particular character because oftentimes that person you've seen on TV isn't actually the real person. You understand what I'm saying? And they do that and they present that to you. But you vote because that's the Democrats or that's the Republicans, Republicans or whatever the case may be. So I think in the U.S. and these larger places, even in Trinidad, I would say it's, 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 it's very true. The parties can claim that you are voting for us far more than the personalities. But in Tobago, we actually know the people that we are voting for. So is it the same? And I think for me, that is one of the things about this act that I absolutely love. It's one of the few documents, I think, in the Caribbean that sort of reflect how we live codified in a document. So we know, or, or, or I should say, A.N.R. Robinson knew, and whomever else helped him write it, that we would actually be voting for people that we know, and we trust, and we grew up with. And so for them, if you look at the act, you realize that the assemblymen are almost sacrosanct. You can't just remove them. Because the people put them there because they know them and they trust them. Just because you come and snag them up under the banner of a political party, you're not going to have the right to remove the person that the people put there. And I think, that, I think that's beautiful. It reflects our reality. We know them. One of the areas we want to touch on very quickly as well that you would have noted um, in, your, in your video spoke to the issue of that has been largely said, which Roy Charles makes it clear that the Tobago House of Assembly Act as one of the persons who contributed to framing as well is not premised on political parties. Um, and I know you would have made reference and just give us a little clarity with regards to that where the references have actually been made to party within the context of the Tobago House of Assembly Act. So there, there are three references in the Tobago House of Assembly Act using the word party, all right? One of the references basically says, hey, if um, the assembly was involved in a legal matter previously, then when you install a new assembly, this new assembly is still party to the proceedings of that legal matter. Clearly, that doesn't mean political party, right? The only other two references to party in the document is where it says how a councillor is picked. And the councillor is picked by a person or a party, Yes. right? And then the next reference, or the next time you see the word party is when it tells you how to remove, well, not how to remove a councillor, what happens after the councillor is removed. Those are the two references to the word party. Now, here's the funny thing. You see that first reference to party? Just above that first reference, and I wish they could bring it back up on the screen, just above the first reference to party where it's talking about the councillor. Mm -hmm. You see where it says 19.1, A, B, C, D, and E? Those are the areas that tell you how an assemblyman is removed. Now, here's why this is noteworthy. 
just below that, number two, I am using the word party, and I am telling you that a councillor could be removed based on the party or person who put him there. And just above that, I don't use the word party to tell you how an assemblyman could be removed. So tell me how purposeful is that? It's not that I forgot. I wrote it right after. <laughs> you understand? I have deliberately left the word party out. So when people are talking about, oh, the assembly is silent on it, and that's nonsense. It, the assembly is not silent on it. The assembly tells you how that person can be removed. The assembly doesn't have to say how, the, all the ways they can't be removed. By definition, if I tell you how they can be removed, then they can't be removed any By other, other way. ways. So you're you're automatically saying that. Exactly. So people keep saying, well, it didn't speak about that. It didn't speak about a lot of things. A lot of other ways, you know? And one of the things I have to, I have to get very quickly from you, Jason, before we wrap this morning, I know we are also operating in a space. Marketing uh, is one of your, your, your areas of focus. One year in, we're looking ultimately, and particularly with this matter that has come up, we're hearing perspectives from the PDP, we are hearing um, from the PNM. How do you feel ultimately when you look at um, the various brands you now that are out there, um, specific at that to the, the, the PNM, the PDP, and then obviously the collective of um, Farley at this point and the, the, the other independents who at, at this point have separated themselves from the PDP. How do you posture those, those brands in the Tobago space currently? All right, so let's talk about branding. All a brand really means is that when I think about this particular brand, there are these images and ideas that pop into my head. So for instance, let's say Apple. When you think of Apple, you have these images and ideas, okay? Now, as a consumer, my only concern about a brand is how it affects me. So if, let's say Apple, if I buy an Apple phone, I know I can sell it back for a certain amount of money. If Apple changes its name, that's going to affect me because I may not be able to sell things back for as much as, as previously. In the same way, if we're talking about brands, brand PNM and brand PDP, the question is, A, what do those brands stand for, one? And two, is anything about what these brands stand for beneficial to me? Right? Because outside of that, I don't particularly concern myself with your brand. Yeah? And so right now we are saying you have a brand PNM and a brand PDP. Well, I don't know what the brand PNM necessarily stands for other than longevity. Now, some people may say that's valuable. Well, I don't know how valuable the longevity of the party is and how valuable that is in terms of governance because we actually have a government. Yeah? And once you have a government, things are running. The fact that your party is X or Y or Z or whatever the case you might have been around for all these years doesn't necessarily affect the actual governance. The government will still run, as it is running right now. So the question really is, what do you stand for that benefits me? And I think that is something that people have to answer. What does the PNM stand for that benefits you? And what does the PDP stand for that benefits you? I think people only know those answers individually. Now, all the other games that are going on with you know, the PNM saying this about the PDP and the PDP saying that, I don't know how far that's going. I don't know how well it's penetrating. But for me, it's always, what do you stand for? And how does that translate into a benefit for me? Inside right. of that. Excellent. Thank you very much there, uh, Jason Arthur, this morning, um, giving us his perspectives and the clear interpretation. And I like the level of certainty. It's not just an interpretation, but quoting what the facts are specific to the Tobago House of Assembly, the Tobago House of Assembly Act, the Constitution, and then more importantly, the standing orders of the Tobago House of Assembly and the standing orders that governs the operations of our parliament uh, within the Trinidad and Tobago space. So thank you very much again, Jason Atta, for joining us here on set as we discuss the THA standing orders in layman terms. Uh, viewers and listeners, we have coming up next, Petal Joseph, a managing director and principal consultant. So we look forward to those upcoming discussions with her. But just before, we want to remind you that this is your opportunity to share the live. Share the life, share the life.